Episode three of True Health, The Beards. My wife, Sloan, joins me for this episode as we talk about the new wild west of medicine. Talk about everything from the overuse of high-level interventions like surgeries and medications, the underuse of the good old things like exercise and nutrition. I also have a great McKinsey drill for shoulder pain. See you guys in the episode. Okay, so these are our shoulder extensions. This is a great clearing drill for basically what we would deem mechanical pain in your shoulder. So we have a squat bar set up here. Sloan is gonna grab back on this bar. Now she's gonna try to go down into a squat without getting too much torso rotation because we really just want extension of the shoulder, right? Come back up, she's gonna show a bad rep, so she's gonna start to rotate out because she may have poor mobility. So only if she, if she can only go an inch or two, that's totally fine. Um, as she gets more mobility, we may ask if she can scoot this hand in a little bit, which will also allow for more extension through the shoulder. Now, if you don't have a bar, we could easily use a countertop, the back of a chair, and these are our shoulder extensions. Dub beards, dub beards, dub beards, dub beards. Well, this is the first episode of the beards, so let's welcome Duh the other. Beards. The beard. The beard. Say hey, Sloan. Hello. I just keep saying the beards. Like that's all. How can, how can you not? That's all you get to do is the sound effect of the beards. I'm sorry. The beards. The beards. The beards. Okay. So today's show, uh, I titled "The New Wild West of Medicine," and what got me thinking about this was thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm getting wild my West. Country slang thank on. you. Uh, what got me thinking about this was. Every day we basically have to have, I don't know if I call it a confrontation, but a conversation with a patient, usually a new patient, about something that they've been told, something they've been doing, or it could be something that I've seen on social media, that we, and we're, we're going to discuss both sides of it, where we're seeing things that are done that are uh, advocated for by the USDA, the FDA, the AMA. Um, these are valid things, right? That you know, they're allowed to do, but we know that they're really not efficacious. So we're going to talk about some of those things. Uh, the flip side of that would be because we live in a time where everything is so heavily regulated and uh, under such scrutiny and there's, uh, which there, a lot of these things are good things, right? We're not saying scrutiny and testing and clinical trials are bad, but when there's lobbying power and money behind these things, and that's going to determine what gets pushed through and we're only publishing certain uh, findings and things like that. The flip side is now you're seeing a lot of practitioners uh, who are pushing the limits right, of medicine and all different kinds of medicine, conservative medicine, manual medicine, uh, you know, cancer therapy, nutrition, and they're having to push it where they're not really doing things that are allowed, but are definitely efficacious and probably have more evidence behind them than the things that are being done in a more traditional or dogmatic sense. Uh, so the the first one, and this is just a, a jump off point, and we'll talk about a lot of different things. One of the first things I want to talk about was a uh, really common uh, you know, thing in our society is the use of blood pressure medications and cholesterol medications. And I know Sloan can attest to this with her patient base. We get a lot of people that come in here, and we do a very thorough uh, review of systems, history, and part of that is actually looking at their intake paperwork, which I hope everybody's doing, but please, I think, <laughs> please spend I think some time on that. unpleasantly surprised. Excuse me. There's my sound effect. I'm not going to pull a Jason glass. Not quite. Yet. I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, we love you though, coach. Uh, 
But what we see is people will be on, you know, a blood pressure medication like Sinopril or, you know, something other. And if it's a cholesterol medication, you know, or statin or something like that. But then what I'm always going to ask them and what we always are going to test, we can't test cholesterol in the office, but we can definitely test blood pressure. Um, well, how long have you been on this? What were your original initial numbers? Original? Original initial? Um, what were your initial numbers that got you on this? And how often do you get tested? And is there any kind of plan to ever come off this? Yeah, what's your end game? Um, and the one that stuck out, and you know, maybe I'll use this for the case of the week. Uh, this is a guy that's not too much older than me, and I don't think I'm that old, not quite yet. And this guy turning gray, turning yeah, gray, yeah. silver fox, fox going gray. Uh, this guy had been on blood pressure medication for nine years already. I'm only 34. So it, it just baffles me, especially with the life expectancy nowadays. So that means that this guy is already on this stuff nine years. There's no end game in mind. Um, and we're just kind of going, oh, well, I'm on this stuff. And we know there's negative side effects of these things. And once you're on them, it's kind of, we'll talk, we're going to talk about feedback loops with some of these other issues. Uh, but I just kind of asked Michael, what were your initial numbers? And he goes, eh, if I remember right. And you never take a patient's word for, you know, the, the absolute truth. But he goes, I think it was like 125 or 80. Now, he was on his medication Should when he came in here that day. Yeah, that's norm, right? The, the norm, which we need to talk about, is 120 over 80, right? And that, that's going to have a, a buffer. And that norm I th- is, is attempting to shift up a little oh, higher. 100%. It is shifting up. It should. Up yeah. And you got to um, ask who's setting that norm. Who, who dropped it so low in the first place? But then, A, what is our, our plus and minus? What's our buffer on that? So now we're saying he had five points of mercury or millimeters of mercury where he was tested once in an office, was prescribed, which I'm sure he got tested after that, prescribed lisinopril and told to take this. Let's also point out the fact that majority of people's blood pressure is going to be slightly elevated in that setting anyways, because who's completely relaxed when they're getting their blood pressure taken? Right, so five, five, five per points degrees yeah. of mercury whatever whatever you want to call it that seems it's, negligible so what i asked him which was you know the follow-up well how what are your numbers on the medication and this is the kicker well probably around 110 over 70 <sighs> so we're putting him on med- medication and technically giving him low br- blood pressure via medication this isn't baselining him some people do need blood pressure medication but almost all medications from the pharmaceutical standpoint that we think of are stopgap treatments. They're going to get rid of mass effect symptoms over a short period of time while we learn how to control the, the real start of the fire, right? The fuel, not just the flames. Uh, but this guy was taking medication, going into uh, the realm of low blood pressure, no end in sight. And I'm not, this had probably no correlate to his, the issues that I was seeing him for, but this is insane. And this is normal. Yeah. I, I wish, and, and maybe, maybe our patients are getting these options and then they're not following through on them. I know a lot of people in our country, they want the easy step. They want that pill, and yes, that may take care of their high blood pressure, and they don't want to hear what the other options are for high blood pressure. And perhaps you get a prescription for high blood pressure and you look at that, okay, I'm going to be on this as short term as possible and I'm going to carry out X, Y, Z that I need to do to make sure that I pull my blood pressure back down. Things like eating differently and exercising, getting some cardiovascular which, exercise. Which we're going to talk about in detail yes. here in a while. I don't mean to jump forward. I, it's just... But I just want to bring that up first to talk about it. So let's talk about normative values. Well, I do want to throw this out there. I actually have a lot of patients that are put on cholesterol medication and high blood pressure medication as a preventative step. Yeah, prophylactic use yeah, via they, medication. They don't even have those high recorded numbers. So it's in, they're in their genetic history, in their family history. So let's go ahead and put you on this prevent for preventative measures. Which this is where uh, you've probably seen me talk about, you know, genetic testing using 23andMe and LiveWell and Ancestry.com. Uh, 23 Me actually had to strip down a lot of the, the results that they were giving people because what we know, and this is kind of interesting, the reason they had to do that is uh, there is data out there that, the, that says there is self-manifestation, right? And it's probably at an epigenetic level, though, when you see that you have a predisposition genetically for things like breast cancer, hypercholesterolemia, uh, high blood pressure. Yeah. You think and you're going to have it? You yeah, have you're going to have it. Now we see manifestations. 
so whoever, I don't know what the regulating body that basically made them strip that down, if it was the FDA or the AMA, uh, they can't put up things like the a Parkinson's marker anymore, breast cancer. They can't say, hey, you have oh. this, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, or at least they can't say it increases your likelihood. They may be able to just say this is the marker that's correlated to, but they can't say the preponderance or the percentage increase because it just gets people thinking about that. So then this goes down almost the pain you know, uh, rabbit hole. Yeah. You if, can think yourself sick. You can think yourself in pain. If somebody tells you you're broken, you're, you're broken, gonna, you're going to be broken. And that's what we do with every day. And you can get it into the, the hot and heavy debate of pain neuroscience and the, the explanation that we have to give patients, which we do. There mm-hmm. are those patients mm-hmm. and those patients usually have had a false narrative written for them. Well, it's no different for anything else. Like we're pain is a physiological response. So is blood pressure. So is, you know, laying mm-hmm. down cholesterol in your arteries and arterioles. Like it's the same thing. Um, so that, that's one specific, and we're going to go through different kinds of, you know, examples, uh, but on the flip side of each one of these. So that's, to me, that's the, the wild west of like, that's the bandito, right? You got these doctors running around slinging out pills, right? They're pill slingers. I also want to say that's exactly, (laughs) that's exactly the same thing though, as someone in, um, a more conservative approach and like say the chiropractic, uh, uh, realm, that's telling people, oh, you have a straight cervical spine. You have to have chiropractic care for you know x the x amount of weeks for the rest of your life. Whatever it's it can it's not just pill slingers. It's also manual practitioners that are feeding uh, the thoughts that you're broken. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So I don't want this to be a. This is only on MDs because no, golly, it's on, every, it's on PTs, it's on DCs. And it, so I want to have the flip side. I don't want to just uh, paint negative pictures with any of this stuff and just leave right. it there. But what Sloan was saying was, the and more and more uh, MDs are turning to this. It used to be in the realm of professions like ours, chiropractic, naturopaths, uh, a lot of these professions that have been beat up by your traditional medical system for so long that have been bringing, which there is a, a, a huge body of research on um, turning to nutrition first, and turning to exercise first for almost any malady that you could come up with. So what probably grinds my gears the most in the, you know, the words of uh, Peter, a family guy, I can't think of his last name right now, but is the fact that we, we hop to pharmaceutical inter- intervention, which if your blood pressure is 200 over 150, Please. you're either in the ER or you need a medication and probably both. Now, that's stopgap treatment, though. What do we want to get that person doing? Lifestyle modification, which doctors, and this is, I'm going broad strokes, gross generality, the, we do talk about lifestyle interventions or changes, but it's usually old school advice. Stay away from salt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's stay away from fat. Like, you know, like the things that, like, what are we lacking most in our society? Essential minerals, one of those being salt, salt with every, <laughs> that has everything else in it, silica and you know, uh, carbonite and magnetite and all these things. So we're telling people to stay away from fat because we think they have high cholesterol, but we know that it's probably the sugar behind that for the most sponsor, the response to sugar. Mm-hmm. And it's just, again, so we, we go down this path of if we went to an MD and we're like, well, you're just giving them medication. They're like, no, I'm not. I talk about lifestyle modification. It's like, well, tell me what you tell them. Or did you really talk about it or did you hand them a pamphlet on the way out? Right. So what do we know? And, you know, we don't, I'm not even going to, I am going to link to a lot of research um, in the show notes, which check out the show notes, chirofarm.com slash farm media slash wild west. A lot of show notes with a lot of research, but we don't need to post research on exercise should be one of the first things we go to for almost anything, pain, high blood pressure, cholesterol. Oh my gosh. Um, Depression, uh, depression, all these anxiety. things. Anxiety. And then if we think about nutrition, that really is the basis for everything from a how you feed your body, but also how you interact with other people, um, how you think about what you eat. We know all these things will affect you in all different ways. And if we're just slamming pills and think, man, I, I can override all of those other things through pharmaceuticals. Again, that narrative is being spun out of control of like, well, no, why would I need to modify my lifestyle? Mm-hmm. I got a pill. Yeah. Right? And that's been the American mantra, which it is, I believe, slowly changing. In yes, some thankfully. Sets. Yeah. And, and physiologically, the longer you use those cheats or those shortstops, those uh, pharmaceuticals, what have you, um, 
the less likely you're going to be able to take control of that yourself again. So let's talk about that in correlation to another one I want to talk about, which is thyroid medication. Yes. So utilization of thyroid medication is, I don't know, it's been around probably popular for 50-ish years. Um, But the testing for uh, hypo and hyperthyroid is far behind where it should be. So if we go to our GP, usually we're going to get tested for T3, T4, and uh, maybe that's it. Usually we're not even getting reverse T3. We're not getting any of that stuff um, or TSH or any of the precursors to it. Uh, I bet you get a TSH. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but then if we go to an endocrinologist, maybe we step it up a little bit. But there's about 14 to 16 tests that we should be looking at when it comes down to thyroid function because when we start messing with, as Sloan was alluding to, when we start messing with things like your thyroid, which is a uh, kind of a multi-controller, right? It's, it's, it has a couple precursors to its function, but it kind of ri- or, uh, directs a lot of functions in the body. When we start messing with that, we want to be really sure because, again, like uh, Sloan said, if I start taking something like, uh, especially like a synthetic thyroid medication like Synthroid, um, a, there's a lot of problems there. We're going to go through what's called secondary, uh, receptor burnout, right? So as soon as I start making thyroid hormone or basically taking thyroid hormone, um, my body has no reason to produce it. So now I'm stuck in that loop. And the, the thing about something like Synthroid is Synthroid is not recognized as a, a bioidentical hormone. It is, it's slightly different. So it is harder to process. And now there's postulation that that could be causing other autoimmune things because it's not seen as the same. And that's all autoimmune means, right? Autoimmune, you're attacking yourself for some reason. And there's some, uh, I'll put a, an article from uh, Joseph Mercola talking about this where there's uh, basically uh, peptide disruptions where your brain is seeing these markers and it's kind of like, well, this is not the same. So we actually see people that are on Synthroid, especially long-term Synthroid use, where they actually have a decline in their thyroid function. So the thing they're taking them is actually breaking them further. Well, also, typically, uh, hypothyroid is looked at, or Hashimoto's is looked at as an autoimmune disease, right? So once you have one autoimmune disease or influence in your body, it's a cascade event. You can have many, right? It kind of opens up that door for many more to um, rear their ugly head. And so if you're taking something like Synthroid, that is creating almost this... Uh, like foreign invader effect mm-hmm. in your body that can create even more of those autoimmune effects. So. And we're not saying that people don't need medication. Yes, please do also, not take it as that. It's also what medication. So the the difference between something like Synthroid and then Armor, which is a, a naturally derived um, thyroid medication, um, it's vastly different. And there's a lot of research behind that, which I'm going to put in the show notes as well. But what we want to ask is, again, what is the underlying cause of the thyroid dysfunction, right? It, right. It, I, in my opinion, I think it's very rare that your thyroid is just going to be, right? Complete. Unless we're having thyroid cancer, or we have major nodular changes that we end up having, you know, surgically removed part of our thyroid, which again, that may be a very invasive treatment to start out with. Maybe we need to try something else, like removing things from our environment, our diet that have been proven to show thyroid dysfunction, like... And some people may say, well, that's not, there's research on this. Gluten, soy, lack of iodine, lack of salt, right? So when we, when we think about these things, before we add something to, which we've said this before about supplements, which we'll talk about, supplements called supplement because it supplements your diet. Before I go to a medication to supplement the activity of an, a major organ in my body that I'm going to need for the rest of my life, I may want to ask, am I lacking something, right? Is something else going on? And there could be anything from a pituitary tumor to a hypothalamic issue, right? Um, And these could be genetic. They could be derived from a a brain tumor. I mean, that sounds scary, but... Don't scare people. Yeah, but those are options. But that's why we need an excellent review of systems, history, exam, right? And that's what the whole true health mantra is. is like, hey, let's get back to real medicine. And and, and I know a lot of people probably have a big problem with me saying that. Me not being an MD. Wild West of you. I can tell you, I give a shit less, right? <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because I think I do a really good exam, and that does not mean that I'm treating people with thyroid issues. I'm not treating people with blood pressure issues. I'm not treating hypercholesterolemia. What I'm doing is making sure that that is not a correlative factor for what I'm treating them for in the office. And if it is, you better bet your butt. Or if it's not, 
that I'm getting them to the right person, back to their primary care, a different primary care physician, an endocrinologist, a specialist. But that is a big part of being a clinician is knowing when to refer out. And if you, if I'm referring out more often than not, I'm probably doing a better job because that means at least, even if they don't follow through, which some of them we have to make them follow through on because it's very important. Um, if I'm referring out that much, that means I'm picking up stuff that maybe nobody else has questioned, right? Or uh, seeing correlations, right? Cross interactions, like, hate it, and we're going to talk about that next. Yeah. Do, you, do you know your medication could be causing this? Yeah. And again, if you guys have any questions on this, please, uh, again, uh, chirofarm.com slash farmedia uh, slash wild west. Leave us a comment. Leave us a question. You can email me at drbobeard at gmail.com. So, um, so let's, uh, let's talk about fluoroquinolones. Whoa. Let's say it together. Fluoroquinolones. Fluoro One more time. Fluoroquinolones. If you hear that, perk up. All right. So what are fluoroquinolones? Fluoroquinolones are a class of antibiotic, a pretty aggressive antibiotic um, that, I don't know, I should have looked up how long it's been in use. I don't think that long. I want to say five to seven years, maybe longer. I think longer. it kind of comes in um, state or uh, episodes of, of uh, popularity. Well, like they were popular a few years ago and then Antibiotic again. resistance as well and how we have to cycle through things. Yeah. Um, but what are some popular fluoroquinolones? So you can, that would be the, the, the actual name. What are our generic names of the drugs? So things like Cipro, uh, Factive, Leviquin, uh, Floxin. There's a couple others, but the, the two main that we hear about most of the time are Leviquin and Cipro. Yeah. I mean, I was recently prescribed a Leviquin. It's right. So what is the issue with these? And we were talking about how something you take may be causing something that I would see in the musculoskeletal realm. So something so, that is completely approved, is under, under really strict regulations. Again, back to the pew pew. Yeah, pew pew. <laughs> Don't any of you have the guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. Slinging pills. <laughs> Bo's going to come in as a cowboy yeah. from the Wild West here. We got Bucky. <laughs> Bucky. Yeah. Uh, so when we're talking about these types of drugs, it has been shown that there is actually long-term... I'm shrinking here. Hang on. <laughs> uh, long-term peripheral neuropathy. Um, and also, there are, uh, there's also a tenotoxic effect. So basically, this is toxic more so on collagen replication. Um, I'll have to dig into it a little deeper to refresh my memory, but I believe it's messing with uh, IGF-1 and basically how I replicate collagen. So it kind of, if I'm uh, exercising, lifting weights while I'm taking or after I've taken one of these fluoroquinolones, it's hard for me to repair collagen, which means I'm more likely to have uh, tendinopathy, tendinitis, uh, possibly a, a, there's been cases of acute ruptures. It's, uh, it says that on a Cipro bottle. It says as a warning on the prescription which bottle. didn't used to be there. Right. May cause Achilles ruptures. So the tenotoxic effect is in about 20% of patients overall. So that, you got to think that's, that's two, a lot. two out of 10 patients are having some sort of tendinopathy. Um, uh, a kind of offshoot of this, we, we don't want to not mention Accutane. Accutane is a very common prescription given for acne medication to adolescents. So we've got kids that A, are growing really quick. So the collagen uh, repair needed to keep up the, the, the soft tissue growth with the bone growth is uh, huge. And then we're going to give them something like Accutane, which has the same kind of effect, and we see the same kind of things, tendinopathies, soft tissue injuries, uh, pain, you know, musculoskeletal pain. I'll, I'll say I see many adults on Accutane yeah. as well. So. Yeah, more than you would think. Yeah. Um, but I've got to tell the quick story on this of, um, the, basically two years ago, the number one high school runner in the state of Alabama, uh, came to me and I had seen him prior for true injuries and he came to me and he just said, Hey, I, my legs burn. I can't, and I can't run fast. I was like, I don't know if I know how to fix the running fast part. Well, let's did a full exam and really couldn't find anything going on. Um, so I suggested that he go back to his pediatrician, his pediatrician examined him again, which he had been to his peds first, uh, pediatrician, uh, very intelligently pulled the trigger on, Hey, let's get you a specialist. Ended up being this kid had either, I want to say two, um, maybe just one round of Cipro for an upper respiratory infection, which ended up being probably viral because it didn't touch it. That's another thing to address. Um, and this kid ended up losing scholarships. This, we're talking about a footlocker runner here. Uh, number one runner in Alabama, lost his scholarships, is not running now. 
Um, and I'm not going to blame that doctor that prescribed that stuff. But what we want to what we want to address here is um, who are we giving the medication to, not what are we giving the medication for. That's very different. If I give Cipro to a 55 year old guy that's a desk jockey that has a URI that we we deem is probably bacterial, right? It's, which is part of the exam, um, from fever manifestation to uh, uh, rapidity of onset uh, to you know chronicity of all these things. But if I give it to that guy, he's probably not going to have anything. Warn him, don't go play basketball this yeah. weekend, next weekend. But but if I have a kid that is crushing 67 mi- 60 to 70 miles a week and is on scholarship. Has a potential scholarship, yeah. And I know that there's these possible ramifications, you better bet that goes on my radar. During, and are there other, op- other options? Absolutely. During or at the beginning of a season. Yeah, absolutely. Not even just, oh, this is June and he's off right now. Um, I wanted to throw in an example of um, the Lexaprin. Um, I have a gymnast, previous gymnast now, that was that was prescribed that medication for an upper respiratory infection that wasn't responding to other things um, without any sort of warning or um, caution. And now several months out is still dealing with acute onset of uh, peripheral neuropathy. I mean, we're talking a, a competitive gymnast that now has a very hard time walking across the room. And this, so the runner I was talking about ended up having to go to a clinic that was four to five hours away from here and basically having like almost dialysis treatments to basically like run this out of his system or maybe not, I think it was maybe immunoglobulin. Globulin, wow. (laughs) Sound really smart. Um, Treatment to basically reset that function because he was having that breakdown at the protein uh, basically level. Uh, But huge manifestation you know, uh, ramifications from just a simple choice, right? And every day, our choices of, hey, I had you do some lumbar extensions may not have that big of a deleterious effect. I'm telling you right now, you've heard stories, I know you have out there, of somebody getting adjusted and they end up stroking out, whether that is causative or correlative, and I'm not going to go down that pathway today, it doesn't matter. If it's on my radar, which it has showed up in our office numerous times, you better bet you're going to get the warranted imaging at that point, which we're going to talk about imaging next. You better bet you're going to get the warranted imaging of a CTA or uh, some type of angiogram to make sure like, oh, there is no, at least what we can see from a vascular or an imaging standpoint, no vascular compromise because you showed up today with the worst headache of your life with visual manifestation and dizziness and nausea. Dizziness, yeah. Yeah. Do you think if I adjust your cervical spine with that, I'm asking for trouble, whether that causes that or not. It's just not good. It's not good medicine, right? I don't think that's Wild West of you at all. <laughs> no, but what is Wild West is pew pew. Ooh, <laughs> slinging pills at things that we don't even know that are bacterial, viral, and hoping. Really, that's like shotgun approach. Yeah. Spray and pray, right? I hope it works. Um, so let's talk about um, let's talk about pain actually, and this. Do we have another couple hours? <laughs> yeah. We'll be quick, and then we'll, we'll go to the, the good side. We'll go to the wild, wild west of uh, the, the game changers, uh, the Mavericks. That's a good Western movie. Ever in it? Mel Gibson? Oh, I've Maverick. seen it. On the train? That's one and, that and I have boat. seen. Oh, and, he was a boat. No, there's a train, too. Oh, he's a train. both. Yeah. He had aces at the end? Um, they do play poker, so there's probably... <clears throat> it's just a pair of sixes. If you can beat that, you got me licked. Aces involved. One movie that I have seen. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, but what's up, Mel Gibson? You, if you're listening to this, he's definitely a listener. I love you. I love the Patriot way more though. Okay, so pain. I talked. I gave some statistics on the very first episode about opioid use. Um, go back to that first episode. Check out those stats. It's pretty eye-opening. Uh, what I want to talk about this is when we, when a primary care physician, which kudos to primary care physicians and internists and um, general practitioners, because it's mm-hmm. tough. You have to know a lot. Yeah. We had lunch with the concierge MD here not too long ago, and he was like, I literally had to know everything all of the time and be on call all the time. And he goes, you have to be a triage wizard, wizard, which I love. I I love the idea of proper triage. Um, And hopefully here in a couple episodes, I'm going to get a good friend of mine on here to talk about triage from the uh, sports medicine standpoint. But when we talk about pain, we handle things, in my opinion, completely backwards. 
we start at the highest level of intervention and then it goes down to little old us, right? <laughs> Usually the, the Cairo. Bottom of the total. Mall. Off in the, the strip mall with our chiropractor <laughs> sign and we'll Back adjust pain. it, right? Yeah, I got my pew, pew, I'm throwing adjustments out too. <laughs> But we usually start, and you'll see people come in here. I had a woman the other day, severe back pain. She yeah. went and she had a Toradol injection, uh, given lower tab. Uh, I can't, I think she was given volume as well because she was freaking out. All right. Yeah. But you got to think that cocktail is <laughs> it's pretty, I don't know, that's like uh, if I was in a, a duel, right? Mm-hmm. And they're like, it's only six shooters, and I just pulled out like a bazooka, right? <laughs> um, but I asked her, did that touch the pain? No, because it was neurologic, right? That's <laughs> the examination that occurs. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to knock ER physicians because they're handling a lot of stuff, but she went to the ER and they just gave her all this stuff. Well, all of that stuff could lead this person down a path of destruction, yeah. right? And that's the scary thing here. If we start with these, these grandiose interventions that again are stop gap treatments, if we need to get somebody out of pain because they're um, it's going to you know, cause them more harm, right? They're going to go into shock. They're going to have this emotional distress, which then furthers the pain cycle. Yeah, let's use some medication. I'm not telling you not to. But when I haven't done any examination and all I'm saying is, well, we got an x-ray, nothing's wrong. Here's all this stuff. Hope you feel better. Who knows what that, you know, have they ever had an addiction in the past? That, that's on the questionnaire, but what if they say no, right? Because they know that they want it. Um, what if they never come see anybody after that and they just start taking this stuff or in three months, it happens again, they got to do it cyclical, again and they, they know, well, I'm going to go get that pain medication because it'll stop it for now. But what we, the other part of this is when we get somebody, let's say that the pain medication does help, right? What all we've done is override a very natural physiological response of pain. Pain is communication, right? And when I go to a doctor and I get uh, an opioid, a steroid injection, a lidocaine injection, um, even uh, high dose anti-inflammatories, right? Your 800 milligram ibuprofen or hydrocodone that you're going to get from the doctor. Um, hydrocodone's not an NSAID, sorry. Um, opioid. But when I get all that stuff, all I'm doing is overriding that pain signal, which may make me feel good, but I still haven't addressed why I got there in the first place, which again, in my mind, sets people up for a fail. We will use pain intervention with somebody that is uh, legally allowed to do that when we're seeing that, hey, we need to override pain because we're not able to do that through movement, um, you know, manual therapy, because the pain is inhibiting my ability to change the pattern that's causing the pain. That's rarity, but we've done it. We've sent people for an injection, uh, you know, things like that. But when that's the first line of defense or setting people up for a huge fail, And again, I'll use a very quick example. I had a woman that uh, over two years ago had a back surgery because she had just one day at work, had all of a sudden searing pain down her leg. She couldn't walk. Um, She had a microdiscectomy, woke up, no pain. Was fine, literally fine for two years. This is a very rare case that it's, I got back pain. I never had it before. I get surgery. I'm good. But two years later, she said, man, I want to work on some strengthening of my core and stuff. And she went to a, a local PT I started doing some PT, and I I think it may have been the first visit, maybe the second visit, started having severe back pain. Um, And in my opinion, a lot of this was the emotional response to the first incident, and the fact that she was fixed by surgical intervention gave her this premise of like, well, the PT caused it, now I can't move, I already had surgery, I can't have surgery again, what do I do? And now when you start looking for the solution and it's not there, we see the snowball get bigger and bigger. Well... We, she came in to see me, and two, three visits later, she's doing great. Um, well, all of a sudden, she's on the schedule, and her, uh, her significant other comes in with her, and she goes, well, I would rather you see him today, and I'm talking to her significant other, and basically, she had an episode of an exacerbation over the weekend, uh, nothing that she did. She just went to a wedding, woke up the next day, 10 out of 10 pain. Um, went to the ER. They did an x-ray, right? Um, they're like, we, Shocking, we nothing's fractured? Yeah. <laughs> Your bones aren't out of place. Dear Lord, you don't have an L4 in your pocket, do you? we got to put it back in. (laughs) Um, But basically, they gave her a steroid injection, which she said said lowered her pain, I think, from an 8 or 9 out of 10 to almost a 5. She went to her friend that's a PT the next day, got it down to about a 3 out of 10. She came to see me, and she's like, you know what? I I just I want to know what's wrong with my back. Nothing. In my opinion, nothing. What's wrong is your feedback loop was broken from the beginning, 
not that you didn't need the surgery, but now your, your emotional response to pain was elevated now. And this is why I'm bringing this up. I told her, I go, I think you just set yourself back three months by that little round of basically steroid injection because she overrode the natural pain response, which was her brain telling her, you stood in heels at that wedding for five to six hours. I didn't really like that, but that shouldn't cause that pain. Yeah. And her response was cover it up. Right. And I think she is doing PT now, but we had to have a conversation that was not easy. Right. And during the conversation, the emotion came out. Um, and if that's not addressed, that's a completely sub, you know, different, you know, topic for a, a future conversation. But when we go to the highest level of intervention first, we are going to fail, I would say, 90% of the time, whether that's surgery, opioid. Um, right, because 10% actually need to be there. Right. And how do we figure out what 10% need to be there? You go through conservative measures first. In, in a, a proper exam. exam. And the conservative, even the conservative measures start with a proper exam to know what the heck we should be doing in a short time frame to know that a trial of care, which a trial of care trumps advanced imaging, yeah. um, you know, almost any kind of diagnostic test that you could do is going to be trumped by a very good trial of care. And the trial of care, if it's failed, is then going to be backed up by imaging, testing, labs. Um, and only, in my opinion, only at that point, uh, with throwing out an acute trauma or red flags of, you know, infection, tumor, things like that. How, how do you find out those red flags, though? I think I... Oh, did you mention that? Oh, it's, it's an exam. Oh, exam. Yeah. Exam. Oh, it comes, back, it comes back to that exam. Um, but without doing those things, I mean, it, you know, you, you, again, I broken record. You're setting people up for a fail, mm-hmm. right? So let's go to the happy wild west. Yes. Like, what's the west world? That's not very happy. Oh, no. It's a I'm, great show, I'm just though. thinking like the saloon. It's all. Go ahead. Skin it. Skin that smoke wagon and see what happens. No, it's not always happy in a saloon. I know. They're always fighting. Uh, uh, is there much, is there happiness? Doc Holliday is always kind of happy, even though he's really drunk and he's got... Nonsense. I've not yet begun to defile myself. Tuberculosis, he ends up dying. Oh, that turned really south. Yeah. Okay, the happy happy side of the Wild West. Yeah, so... One thing that's funny to me is you have these, these mavericks out there and uh, this could be MDs, naturopaths, functional medicine practitioners, chiropractors, PTs. Uh, I'm going to have somebody on a show here pretty soon who's a pharmacist that's working in this uh, facet. But we're turning to nutrition and supplementation and exercise first. What's funny to me is that you will hear feedback from our patients and other people's patients and general pop that when I talk to my physician about the supplements I'm on, they tell me how dangerous they are. Right, so think about this Wild West notion. Mm. Man, these supplements, right? Th- this vitamin D. Well, there's no research that that vitamin D can help with that. Or, which I do agree with this partially, you don't know what's in that supplement. 100%. Could be sawdust. Could be horse manure, right? <laughs> Those have been shown to be in supplements. So high-quality supplements, right? So let's remove that part of it. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the, the research behind supplementation. It's hard to get into specifics, but let's use one example. So let's talk about vitamin A. Uh, any physician out there has probably heard of the possibility of vitamin A anosis, right? Toxicity through taking too much vitamin A. Dun, does, dun, dun. Yeah. Sounds does anybody boy. have any idea how much vitamin A you have to take to die or have symptoms? Um, I'm going to throw a guess out there, and I'm going to say it's a lot, more than you could ever take. I don't think anybody's ever found out. There's only been one death attributed to vitamin A toxicosis, and we don't even know if that was correlative or causative. Um, But what we know we can use high-dose vitamin A for, assuredly through research that has been published, is antiviral effects. So high-dose vitamin A for five to seven days, and we're talking high-dose. So if you take something like cod liver oil out there, usually you're taking 5,000 to 10,000 IUs a day. Um, The one I take is 5,000 IUs. So I'm going to take... 400 to 500,000 I use a day for five to seven days for an antiviral function. I bet you that runner wishes he would have known about that instead of Cipro. Yeah. But what would that, you know, I'm not, I'm just, again, we're painting generalizations, but what we hear more often than not, if somebody brought that up, like, oh, whoa, where's the data on that? Where are the, the trials that have been paid for by Novartis yeah. <laughs> and, you know, all of your other major pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, they, they don't exist because they're done by 
small entities, colleges, um, some supplement manufacturers are paying for these things, but they're not done for the most part on the level that we need to get them into the general uh, medical purview because there's not a lot of money to be made except from a supplement company, right? And again, it's tough when you, whoever's paying for the research is going to profit from it. There's always going to be something that steers it the wrong way. Excuse it, yeah. Um, another thing to talk about with this would be uh, basically exercise. So we, this is a very common one, and this, uh, I'm sure almost everybody out there watching has probably experienced this. You go to your doctor, you tell them that you got knee pain. Uh, they say, well, when did the knee pain start? And you say, well, I've been running for about three months. What is it? It's running. Running caused your knee pain, 100%. Don't run. Don't run anymore. Sorry, got to give it up. You have a uh, too much. You have a surplus of running in your, your life, sir. <laughs> that's, what we're, that's your diagnosis, ICD-10 now. We need surplus of running, surplus of CrossFit, surplus of swimming. What we don't need is we have what what – the prescription then, the other diagnosis, the secondary would be deficiency in ibuprofen, right? Deficiency in lower tab, deficiency in laying off of running, right? We, we have deficiency in all those. Or just go home and rest, right? Let's sit more. Let's sit more <laughs> and that'll, that'll fix it, right? But we have people out there that are literally taking people with both musculoskeletal issues and then also metabolic issues, which if we want to talk about the area of metabolic syndrome and... Uh, love them or hate them crossfit is doing a wonderful job at marketing themselves in this niche of like hey we're not only working on you from a, a movement standpoint and a fitness standpoint but they're getting into metabolic syndrome which some of their stuff a little off kilt um, but for the most part yeah if you move more and you move often more often you eat a little bit better a lot of shit's gonna get better yeah. if you add some really good sleep to that which should be on the front end if we went down my hierarchy it would probably be sleep and nutrition together, movement second, um, emotion and kind of relationships would be right there, and then kind of probably spirituality, right? That's like our, our pyramid, and then nutrition is hydration, right? That's up there too. Um, but if we tackle it like that versus on the top, it's medical inter intervention of surgery medication, right, that swirls at the top of the, the, the pyramid, which means that the pyramid's flipped upside down completely, what you end up with is the foundation of the pyramid is a giant population of fat, sick, movement-deprived people that are misinformed, which if I had to give a, a, a rebuttal statement to what the show's about, that's it, right? It, it is what's happening to our society, and now it's spreading out of the Western culture because Western culture is permeating everywhere else. Yeah, influencing. I'd also add in um, to the big, large group of fat, sick pill popping generation it's also very expensive bill ridden generation think of how much money that is spent on healthcare. that and these interventions now nutrition and supplementation can get somewhat expensive right like it costs more money to buy organic produce um to buy grass-fed beef beef to um have a gym membership but at the same time we don't have to go so far down the rabbit hole of biohacking and, you know, being a, a, an elite CrossFit athlete and spending, you know, tons of time and money. Um, you know, minor changes in major areas of your life will have huge ripple effects. Does it cost anything to make sure that you're getting good quality sleep at night? Not unless you're uh, Gary Vee, right? He didn't sleep. No, he actually, he addressed that. He does sleep. I, I guess if it does decrease on your time that you're working... But, However, no, you can argue your but productivity increases when, when you we look at the, ROI, the right? Mm -hmm. Return on investment. Yes. Not, well, I don't I was going to think of a funny acronym. <laughs> I don't have a funny acronym for that. You sound like me. <laughs> um, but when we look at ROI on spending the money up front on your own health and what it's going to save you, right? There's companies that are coming out, life insurance companies, or, you know, run IQ. Do you run? We'll reduce your rates. How smart is that? Yeah. Well, guess what? Take control of your own damn life. Spend a little bit of money, spend a little bit of time on yourself, and maybe you don't have to pay for $1,000 worth of prescriptions every year. Maybe your insurance doesn't cost you $1,000 every month because you don't have pre-existing conditions of blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol, heart conditions, uh, your skin's falling off because your autoimmune issues. That's, I don't know, that's not a real condition. What kind of is? Eh, maybe. <laughs> yes. You know? But what I'm saying is this, and this is common sense. But common sense does not pervade our society. No. 
we're being indoctrinated by doctors, right? And I know I am not an MD, but I'm a doctor, and my goal is to break that cycle. May not happen, but I'm doing it one person at a time, one patient interaction. Only reason I'm one doing the show, view at a time. All right, and literally, that's why I want to hear from you guys. I want your questions so I can help address them specifically. Because if you have a question, other people have a question. All right. So the the notion of this the wild west, uh, it's it's good and it's bad. Um, I I liken this to uh, let's go back to Tombstone. All right, Kurt Russell, he's uh, Wyatt Earp. Should have brushed up on my westerns. I wish. So I maybe I'm kind of like Wyatt Earp. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. But I think there's more Wyatt Earps coming down the line, right? And there's far, I don't know what, what was, I can't remember the, the rascal cowboy that he ended up beating, but they wore those red bandanas. Those little oh, red yeah, bandanas yeah. to me are like white coats. The cowboys are finished, you understand me? I see a red sash, I kill my man wearing it. So run, you cur. Uh, run! Tell all the other curs the line's coming. You tell them I'm coming, and hell's coming with me, you hear? Yeah. Right? And I'm not saying, please do not take this as I'm saying all MDs are bad. It's the system. It's a system that's been built, and I think there are plenty of physicians that are trying to break the mold, plenty of people that are seeing through the, the kind of the, the dark mesh of all of the kind of crap uh, dogmatic stuff we've just believed for so long. But what we can't be is we can't be tied down completely to research. We can't be tied down completely to um, what has worked in the past. And I think anybody that's at the forefront of anything, not just medicine, right? Engineering, technology, um, I don't, you know, nutrition. Like you have to push it a little bit. But we do this through, you know, A, it is evidence-based, but also like this is where you're seeing this huge ancestral movement. There are things we've done for you know thousands of years, right? Like coffee, <laughs> right? People have been drinking this for thousands of years. In the 50s, it got demonized because a lot of the studies on the the negative effects of coffee were done on people that the most people that drank coffee also smoked and had a le- lack of exercise. So we saw these huge correlations of oh, caffeine has negative effects like high blood pressure and metabolic disease and heart disease. Well, no, no, it doesn't. It actually offsets all that stuff. It's the highest antioxidant load of any plant that you could basically, that a human could consume, and it's the number one consumed plant on earth. Yeah, it got demonized in the the normal medical track in the 50s, and now it's, you know, what, 60, 70 years later, we're reversing all that stuff. And that is evidence. But what we did is we looked at something that somebody, that people had been doing for eons, said, ooh, well, this says this. Well, no, what had changed was our environment. Right? We did other things with it. And if I, we're going to end on this, you will never change yourself unless you change your environment. If you say, man, I, I, I would love to get off my blood pressure medication, but I'm not going to stop eating a certain way. I'm not going to give up my booze. I'm not going to exercise. That's your environment. That's you know, micro or uh, kind of internal environment, right? Your body, what's happening physiologically, but also external the easier you make it on yourself from an environmental change, the easier it is for you to change. And just take the, the idea of junk food in your house and trying to lose weight, right? If the Twinkies are there, you're going to eat them, right? If you do not pack your gym bag the night before, the likelihood of you working out is lower, right? If I never ask my physician a question about my medication, nothing's ever going to change. If I never educate myself just a little bit I don't even know to ask the question in the first place. And what I want to really end on here is I was talking to a friend who's an attorney um, while I was in D.C. the week before, and he was asking me what I really want to do in, in regards to this kind of stuff. And I said, I want to educate people uh, to allow them to live a better life, and that could be in every facet of health. And he goes, that's really cool, but I ain't got time for that. Right? I do want to be educated, but I don't have time to learn all this stuff. So what I'm telling you is you just have to be educated enough to know you need to change. And then there are plenty of people out there like me or, like I said, functional medicine practitioners, naturopaths, chiros, MDs, right? There are great people out there that are willing to help you change your health, but you have to realize that there's something that needs to be changed first. And the only way you can do that is listening to shows like this or talking to people that are smarter than myself or know more about health than you do. I think saying that you don't have time for that is a, 
is a little bit of a cop out. And I know the person that you're speaking of, and I apologize for calling you out like that. But there's there's always there's always time for self improvement if you make it enough of a priority. Well, and he definitely wants to self improve. His and to his defense, which I'm I'm being your your defense yeah. lawyer here. <laughs> Uh, he was saying, I have a finite limit on that. I do not want to be a health expert. I'm a lawyer, and yeah, I understand. You don't have to be. But that's where I'm saying, like, this isn't me selling, hey, let me be your, your health coach. This is me telling you, I'm also not a lawyer. I am not going to take myself to trial. Do I need to educate myself about something before I go to court? You bet your butt, or I'm mm-hmm. going to probably get taken, right? Either by my lawyer or the other lawyer. He would then suggest to you that you need to surround yourself by people that will 100%. So you need help. a team. Correct. Yeah. And again, that team could be, you know, in your area. This is the hardest part. I was listening to, I think this was maybe the Aubrey Marcus podcast. I don't know. But he had a physician on there and he was like, how do people find other people like you? He's talking to an MD, you know, and this is an MD that's really pushing the limits, a forerunner. And he's like, it can't. He goes, you could get on the functional medicine medicine website. But he goes, just because you're certified in something does not mean that you practice a certain way that's really looking out for people's health in the best way possible because when something like this becomes popular, right, wellness, somebody's there to capitalize. And when we put capitalizing financially in front of somebody's health, we're right back in the same cycle and you're going to see all these things bastardized and that's what you're already seeing, that people are claiming the title of functional medicine, health, wellness. Wellness has been beaten to death over the last 10 years and it just becomes this watered down thing so people can make money. So if you got if you're out there listening to this and you need help finding somebody, send us a message. We'll try to help as best we can. And that's probably gotta be done on a one-on-one basis of like, hey, where are you at? What what do you need done? Um, there's not directories out there, you know, ask your ask your friends that hey are healthy. <laughs> so if somebody's <laughs> doing something good, ask them what they're doing. Maybe they're lucky. Maybe they got a team already. I also say people that have an interest in this in in health also have a passion to teach others about it 100 percent, and that's why we're here on the podcast today is to teach others um even if it's only if one person listened to this maybe there's only one person that's ever going to listen hey to this. i will be thrilled if one person makes a step one in person, a different direction yeah